Hey there, folks. Welcome to today's episode of the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. My name is Anthony Taylor, and today I'm joined by Andrew Bartlow, who is the founder and managing partner at People Leader Accelerator. Andrew, how's it going today? Hey, going, going all right. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Excellent. Well, I'm excited to chat. Uh, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about what PLA is, who you are, and what brought you to where you are right now? Sure, sure. Uh, th thanks for teeing it up. Uh, so I, uh, I'm an HR guy. I have 25 years doing human resources inside giant companies like Pepsi and GE, um, startups, less than 50 employees, and you know, really capped my in-house career a few years ago, uh, taking a company public, uh, real estate tech company now known as Invitation Homes. Um, I pulled my golden parachute, hung my single shingle as a consultant. Um, wrote my bucket list book. Uh, thanks Columbia University for publishing that for me. And uh, yeah, today I'm a, a venture advisor. I work with uh, private equity firms and I help CEOs, but mostly HR leaders, um, build their people plans, like figure out what they need to do to be more successful from a management um, and people perspective. And People Leader Accelerator is that um, educational uh, organization um, where I work with people one-on-one -on -one and in small groups. Awesome. I love that. So my first question is, since you've worked with such big organizations and then you've worked with smaller organizations, what would you say is the starkest difference between the two and potentially like a, like a wrong assumption about the difference? Ooh. Um, speed is definitely a massive difference. So at, uh, at giant enterprise organizations, it takes a while to get anything done, takes a while to order paper clips, takes a while to make a decision. Um, at a startup, it, it's frantic, it's frantic, it, usually working on too many things, making decisions that um, you know, are often too quickly. Um, determined. Uh, so uh, speed, speed's a big one. Um, you know, speed helps those startups and high growth orgs be successful and speed also kills. So watch out. Um, one thing that I think is often misunderstood between the two, that there's this hubris at startup orgs that just because a big org did something, it's bad. That there's like, the, the big come oh that's a big company practice we don't want to be like that we want to be special and you know our, our snowflake of uniqueness at our startup we're we're the only one that's ever been like us this disruptive so we don't want to do what um, GE is is doing um, but what's funny is they want to do everything that Google is doing or everything that Facebook meta is doing so it's Kind of, kind of interesting how how peer sets and assumptions end up being very different on different sides of that aisle. No, oh, I love that. That's really cool because it's interesting to see on one hand, ideally the goal is to aspire to be those large brands. But then I also find as an entrepreneur myself, I, I and my clients sometimes have an idea of saying, oh, well, I'm different. But really every business is, is the same. And I find it interesting how the scale that supports those larger businesses that have enough resources to do it, uh, they're not that different than the smaller businesses that are trying to put those systems in place. So as those, call it smaller businesses, are developing their people, their talent, their retract, attack, uh, Retention and attraction. You know, yeah. what are some what are some of the stumbling blocks that you're seeing now, and what are you kind of advising people to consider as they take on the next, you know, six, 12, 18 months of growth? Sure. Um, well, let, let's let's get to the advice, the practical advice first, and that's you know, number one, have a plan. Right? Doesn't need to be a hundred page, million dollar um, plan that McKinsey or Bain does for you, but you know, have a plan in terms of what does our growth look like? What is our revenue? What are, what are our costs look like? Uh, what, what does our headcount look like over that foreseeable future? Far too many small and mid-sized businesses that are growing and evolving quickly say, things are changing too fast. I can't plan. 
mm. because the plan will be you know out of date before it's printed. Well, yeah, well, only if you have a really intensive uh, administrative overhead uh, plan, like put something simple together so that you can get your team aligned and have clarity on what your focus and your goals are, and then evolve, you know, plan on that to evolve over time. So first is have a plan. Um, and as it relates to people matters, that's a headcount plan, like how many of pe how many people doing what, maybe where, um, will we need? And of course, that's going to adapt over time. But that, that's really big because that drives your recruitment activities. That allows you to you know, figure out how many managers you'll need. Uh, that allows you to plan for your costs. Um, you know, most small businesses, you know, 80% of your costs are people costs. So that, that's, a big, that's a big nut to be aware of. Um, so it really starts with having a plan. And a lot of that is around headcount. And then everything else around that, I think, is how do you manage those people? How do you manage that headcount as effectively as possible? Hmm. It's interesting because it seems obvious, like to have that plan, but from an entrepreneur lens, and again, I'd be interested to see what our definition of small and medium potentially is, but that if you're just going and like, oh yeah, I, I can't, there's just so many moving parts. And as the CEO, especially if you don't have a talent partner or an HR person to support you in those decisions, you're wearing all of those hats and trying to do that from the, the side of your desk. So what, from a people perspective, do you advise those senior leaders and potentially CEOs on, on how to manage that beyond having a plan, but maybe scaling that HR function? And, and at what point does it become a really worthwhile investment to take that next step in growth? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, it depends. Uh, <laughs> if you're trying to run a playbook, you're going to be more at risk of stubbing your toe and going astray, right? It's like following a map with your eyes closed. Um, helpful to have the map, but boy, you want to be aware of your surroundings. So the point here is um, you need to be really thoughtful about what your org needs right now. So um, I, I think about goal setting and, and planning in, in supply and demand terms. So the demand is, what are the top three or four goals of your organization as a whole? Expand in Europe, grow revenue, you know, expand your number of customers. It's usually stuff like that, right? It's re revenue generating uh, type stuff, usually. Um, and then make sure that your people priorities align directly with those things. You know, we, we HR folks often get stuck working on HRE things rather than the stuff that's most critical and most directly aligned with the organizational priorities. So, right, like we, we far too often come with solutions that are in search of a problem. Oh, I've got this great mental health provider that I think we really need. And we can relate that to productivity and retention and that, you know, we'll calculate it. And that's kind of a third degree removal on, on the logic train from, you know, what's driving your organization success. I, I'd, I'd suggest your people plan ought to be directly connected to those most important goals for your organization. organization. Think about it like a waterfall or an org chart. Like at the top, your CEO is your org goal. Reporting to that CEO org goal is your HR goal. And then what are the initiatives and activities that, that support that? Um, and that'll help you figure out how to build your HR team. So that's the supply and demand. Like, you know, resource your HR team, set your priorities and initiatives in connection with what you're trying to accomplish that will directly support your business. Again, it seems really simple, but far, far too often we're out on HR Island doing things that are you know, progressive and you know, interesting practices that, that aren't as closely connected as they could or should be. Yeah, no, I get that. And I, the, the idea of HR Island is uh, both a funny one, but a, an appropriate one, because I think entrepreneurs, business owners, CEOs who are trying to grow, they focus on the levers that they understand. And a lot of times it's sales. 
they, but they might not understand that HR level, which once you get to that point, your gap is no longer sales. It's no longer market validation. It's probably processes and people. And uh, my wife, who's actually in HR, was telling me, you know, if you're too far removed from product, not only does it not support the business, but you lose that kind of impact contribution from the HR partners, which creates another problem instead of solving a problem. And, you know, us as strategic planners, that alignment, that clarity, that buy-in is critical. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting you talk about that supply demand thing, because there was maybe a year ago, at least from where I sit, I heard a lot of, hey, we need talent, we need talent, we need talent. Now, as we move forward, people are managing that, hey, we need talent, but we also can't get bloated because now we have to manage talent. So I have a very limited lens on people, but what are you seeing in terms of trends that, you know, you just want to share with our listeners that you think that they should be aware of and, and anything that, yeah, that you want to share with them? Hey, this is a volatile market. It's a volatile stock market, capital market and talent market. Um, just before we jumped on this call, I was, uh, I was reading the Y Combinator you know, open letter to founders and encouraging them to you know, assess their burn rate and prepare their plan for um, what headcount looks like and you know, just actively assess where you're at. Um, we've been sharing in the HR communities that I'm a part of the layoff tracker um, as more and more you know, high-flying tech companies are tightening their belts and either freezing hiring or letting people go. I just came off of a one-on-one -on -one mentoring call with, um, you know, a, a recruiting leader at one of the highest-flying unicorns who said they have a hiring freeze. It's not public yet. They have a hiring freeze. This is, this is wild to watch. Like, the, the insane competitiveness of the war for talent that we were in for the past year or so, and at an elevated level for quite a while before that. Um, it, and now uh, layoffs are looming in many cases. So it remains to be seen how this will all you know, shake out and what our steady state will be. But boy, right, right now on May 24th of 2022, we're in you know, some point of, of transition where there's a lot of volatility going on and, and it would be really valuable. I agree with Y Combinator would be really valuable to be assessing your, your current situation and be reevaluating that regularly so that you can take appropriate steps. Like if, if you need the talent to grow, go get it. Uh, but be conscious of your burn rate. Be conscious that raising capital is harder now. Valuations may not be uh, where you want them to be and you sure don't want to raise a down round. Um, you know, so we're at this point of transition and, and uh, I think business leaders would be well served to take a breath and look around. Awesome. I appreciate that. It just, it's a marathon and a sprint and being able to be aware of all of those things. And again, if you're not uh, adaptive planning, so strategic long range, but also, you know, short, medium term and having those shorter cycles, um, I think is, you know, what I heard is, is something critical and, also, you know, being in the Bay Area and being involved with startups and tech, but I think it applies to all organizations. You know, I do a lot of work in the, oh, go ahead. Yeah, well, hey, I just wanted to add to that. Like, hey, I'm in, I'm in tech world, right? But I haven't always been in tech world, right? I was, I was in mortgage and financial services during the booms and busts of, of those worlds in the original dot-com boom and bust. Um, boy, I ran a 25-person recruiting department at Washington Mutual Mortgage. Mm. Remember them? <laughs> yeah, re rest in peace. You're now part of J.P. Morgan Chase, but you know, lar largely were dissolved. Um, and boy, in the interest rate environment, when when mortgage interest rates are dropping, everybody wants to refinance the house. So massive volume in the mortgage business. You hire thousands and thousands of people. When interest rates plateau or go up, like they're doing today, you have zero refi volume. So 90% of your business goes away overnight. Talk about a cycl cyclical business. Holy smokes. So we, you know, my, my last year doing that, we hired 2,500 people, my team of 25-ish recruiters, um, mostly mortgage salespeople. Um, and then we laid off, like, everybody. Like, I, I was in 
ballrooms, uh, letting you know, hundreds, you know, more, more than a thousand people go at, at a given time. My team of 25 recruiters turned into less than five. Um, you know, so these swings in the market, we've, we've been there. We've been there. Th those of us that have uh, you know, been around for more than you know, the, the 12 or 13 year bull run um, ha have seen some of this. And so hopefully we don't go to the depths of the contraction that we saw back in you know, 2007 through nine. Um, but I think it's smart planning for managers of businesses, for leaders of people to be assessing their current situation. Yeah. So it, sorry, sorry for interrupting there, but I just wanted to emphasize this isn't just about tech. This is about business and it's about planning. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think it's, again, really easy as a business owner and an entrepreneur or CEO, what have you, I kind of use the terms interchangeably to only look within your four walls. And I think good leaders, good strategists recognize that there are environmental factors that impact us. There's industry. And there's also like your experience. Like the great thing about having an external advisor like you is not only have you seen various industries, you've seen various phases and that ability to be prepared for it. And capital planning, you know, manufacturing planning is no different than people planning and being able to have that understanding of where it's going. And it creates opportunity too, but you have to kind of batten down the hatches. And it's interesting that everybody had to do that. You know, we just did that two years ago, but I think it has a different flavor. It definitely has a different flavor, a different sentiment, a different feel, and, and, and uh, 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 maybe more dire economic, but regardless, you know, I appreciate your perspective on that because it helps everybody just be more ready and they don't always have that experience. So you listen to the podcast to borrow the experience. <laughs> um, Andrew, I'm so enjoying our conversation now because it really gives people a lot to think about. Is there anything else, you know, again, tech industry agnostic, what are you seeing? What should people be aware of? What do you want people to consider as they take those next uh, steps in their business and in their organizations? Yeah, well, well, it starts with have a plan. So let, let's double, triple down on that. Um, I, I think as in, as in all environments, ruthlessly prioritizing is critical, right? So especially when times are tough and people's, you know, heads are, you know, floating in the news and trying to figure out what, what may be around the corner, offering really strong focus and clarity to your organization is just about a magic wand that, that helps people work on useful things that'll help them and help the company. So fo ruthlessly prioritize, offer that focus and clarity for sure. Um, Patrick Lencioni, author of Five Dysfunctions of a Team and a you know, bunch of other best-selling business books um, has his six questions for clarity. Um, that, that's an exercise I walk a lot of clients through and, and have used to you know, positive effect. I strongly encourage people to check that stuff out. It's free to go find, find on the table group website. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe one more thing um, is context is king rather than content. So that means that what might have been part of the playbook before or the obvious next step in this environment might be different. So really flex your critical thinking muscle you know, and think about what's right for us right now. Um, and I think that's important. And so that, that leads to light planning, adaptable and ever evolving planning, both organizationally, financially, and your people plans. Um, you know, don't, don't overdo it. It's really easy to overcomplicate things. Um, but be willing to be agile, um, while offering that clarity along the way. Yeah. I love that. I think just the some people, I, it being, again, I've come from the strategic planning world, they say, hey, it's like a three-year plan. And like, hey, we set our goals and we set these goals and we said we were going to do it and we do it. But I think what I'm taking away from what you're sharing is, you know, that context, like the game has changed. The game is changing so quickly. And, and for to be adaptive to that is, is so important. And one of the things I used to lead peer groups, which I believe is something that you still do, is understanding not just like your own lens, but having your peers, small groups to share about that, to understand what they're seeing. Because the 
barometer or at least the speed at which you're going to get that in, important information is going to be a lot faster if you have that so can you speak to you know your current experience getting those those small groups together yeah i'm i'm boy just so privileged to be a part of several communities of practice there are 300 or so um hr leaders at high growth mostly tech companies um in this group called people tech partners um, and so it's, you know, the heads of HR at Zoom and Evite and you know, Slack and you name it, like all the, all the you know, big name places. And I'm fortunate enough to be a part of that. We've got a Google group that's super active that um, we trade emails um, multiple times a day. Um, so really nice to have a pulse on the environment. I'm also part of a couple of Slack communities. Uh, one is Startup Experts, where the head of the function whether it's finance ops or HR, it's mostly HR. There are about 400 people um, that are part of this Slack community. Again, really active, open sharing questions and answers. It's great to have a community like that um, where you can get um, questions answered, get a you know, pulse of what's going on. And then you know, People Leader Accelerator, which, which I founded, we have you know, uh, little cohorts, 10 people twice a year, go through our program and boy, they get to know each other really well. They get to know each other's businesses and challenges really well. Um, and we have a Slack community where it's only like 40 people that are, that are part of this, but boy, the response rate and the engagement is off the charts because they have that deep trusting relationship and everybody's in similar jobs at similar types of organizations. So I, I would just strongly encourage your listeners, if you're not already part of some community of practice. And I'm not talking about a LinkedIn group with tens of thousands of people that have never met or, you know, trolls out on Facebook. I'm talking about a group where you can engage and know that it's similar organizations, people in similar jobs that are facing similar issues. You can really benefit from it. Yeah. I love that. Thank you for that. And I think one of the things, or not, I think one of the things that I took away from that is that you don't need to be the expert, but if it's a priority, for you and or your organization, you know, learning more and being aware or understanding of what you don't know and accepting your own limitations. But I think if you're willing to understand it, there's communities that will embrace you, that will support you, that will kind of feed you and you feed them like, you know, the information to support one another. And I think that's the key to being an adaptive leader in this, uh, in this marketplace. Thoughts on that, Andrew? Love it. Love it. Plus 100. Like you, you don't need to go out and get another university degree to figure out how to deal with this stuff. You know, universities are 10 years behind the, the world of practice and tend to be more theoretically and academically oriented anyway. Um, and a Google search uh, can be massively valuable as, also, as well as you know, a little dangerous because you'll get all sorts of stuff come up on a Google search. So that sort of peer community some group of, you know, CEOs have all sorts of these groups, right? From Vistra to YPO to EO and like you, you name it, there are all sorts of CEO groups. But if you're the head of finance or the head of HR or the head of sales or whatever, find your tribe, find your tribe. Um, and that's not just, you know, golf buddies or, you know, people you, you know, drink wine with. It's, uh, it, it's people in similar jobs at similar orgs with similar issues that you can ask questions to and that are open to share. And there are plenty of people out there like me that have kind of been there, done that, that you know, get their kicks and, and their you know, personal gratification out of being useful. So I do all sorts of pro bono um, advice giving and you know, share templates uh, just to be useful. And uh, I'm, I'm certainly not the only one out there. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I appreciate you being on the podcast today because that's definitely useful to our listeners. So uh, let's say we told them to do a positive Google search to send them in the right way. Where could they connect <laughs> with you? Where can they learn more about the People Leader Accelerator? Yeah, thank you. Well, um, fortunately, the website is uh, exactly that, peopleleaderaccelerator.com. Um, my personal uh, consulting and advising work is through Series B Consulting. Um, and some of the groups that I mentioned, if you're an HR leader, you might benefit from checking out uh, startupexperts.us and peopletechpartners.com. So that's a lot of websites. Hopefully you find some of those useful. 
Perfect. And presumably they can follow you on LinkedIn as well. Oh, please. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be, that'd be great. I'm constantly putting out too much stuff on LinkedIn. So, uh, you know, would, would love to have a follow or to have a direct interaction through LinkedIn. Awesome. And for your listeners, for you is I talk to a lot of people, as you know, I've got a lot of great guests on the podcast and I talk to some people who might not know as much. And uh, I I can say from my experience, Andrew gets my stamp of approval, not that he was uh, thinking about it, but really understanding it at that depth and that no BS way is something that I really appreciate and value. So Andrew, thank you so much for the time today. It's been invaluable to me, I'm sure to our listeners as well. And and I just so appreciate it. I, I appreciate you. Thank you, Anthony. You're so welcome. So folks, my guest today, Andrew Bartlow, who is the CEO or founder and managing partner at People Leader Accelerator. Check him out, connect with him on LinkedIn. And I think that all of us as a community can support one another. And if you or your team is looking to get aligned and clear and get ruthlessly clear on your priorities, be sure to reach out to us to help you facilitate your strategic planning session. So my name is Anthony Taylor. This has been the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. Thank you again, Andrew, for joining us. It's been awesome. And everybody, I'll see you next time.